Good afternoon. I think it is right at the noon hour, and that's what time we start. We have a very large crowd today, and that's a very happy thing for us. And I want to invite veterans of this program and new people to uh, this month's installation of Bites and Bits of History, sponsored by the Mahoning Valley Historical Society. For those of you who don't know, Mahoning Valley Historical Society operates this facility, the Tyler Mahoning Valley History Center, and we also operate the Armist Family Museum on Wick Avenue, right on the edge of the campus of Youngstown State University. And so we're about those two sites, but we're about so much more in sharing our region's history to as many people as possible. So thank you for being here today to do that. My name is Bill Lawson. I'm executive director of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society, and um, I just want to run over a couple of announcements before I introduce our speaker, and just so you know what's going on. We are less than, well, less than three days, uh, just maybe almost 48 hours away from our big program called Cookie Table and Cocktails. It's an annual fundraiser for the Mahoning Valley Historical Society, and uh, to improve and continue the programs here at the Tyler History Center. And uh, this year it will be at Our Lady of Mount Carmel's uh, Social Hall. And what it is, there's a buffet supper. Um, there is 50-50, there are basket raffle items, there's a silent auction, uh, there's live music from Del Sinchek and his band, uh, who was a polka guy, but he's also a rock star here in the Mahoning Valley. And, uh, and there's an enormous cookie table. Uh, we're looking at probably 7,000 plus wedding style cookies. And so we've got a lot of tickets that we've sold. We have a few left. If you're interested in this program to support us, but also to, shall we say, attend a wedding reception without the bride and groom, uh, please see us today. Uh, Linda Koska is our development director. She's back at the uh, beverage table there, and she can get you signed up. But we're down to just a few tickets left at this point, and then we'll have hit capacity at the Mount Carmel Social Hall. So that's coming up Saturday evening. We have a couple of special evening lectures coming up as well. And um, this coming Tuesday, February 26th, as part of uh, our community's Black History Month celebration, we will have storytelling in the African American oral tradition. And this will be with Jocelyn and Robert Dabney in this room, uh, 7 p.m. this coming Tuesday. It's a free program, so please come back. There's a flyer about it on the table to give you more information. And then uh, not long after that, in March, when we have Women's History Month on Tuesday, March 12th, uh, we have a program, a panel presentation called Yes, She Can, Women and the Steel Industry. Uh, and we'll be looking back at the history of, of women employed in the steel industry, uh, both regularly but also during World War II when you had the great mobilization. And uh, that again will be at 7 p.m. here in this room at the Tyler History Center. Again, it's free and there's a flyer on the table to give you more information. This is a monthly program that we do with Bites and Bits of History. It's always the third Thursday of the month. And our next installment will be on Thursday, March 21st. And that'll be, again, uh, from Trumbull County. Uh, Megan Reed, who is the director of the Trumbull County Historical Society, will be talking about the John Stark Edwards family. And of course, that's the family around the John Stark Edwards House, which is now the home of uh, Trumbull County Historical Society. So you'll want to come back on Thursday, March 21st. But today, uh, our topic is President McKinley, Major and Mason. And here to present is Amber Ferris, and she is the director of the museum at the McKinley Memorial Museum and National McKinley Birthplace Memorial in Niles, Ohio. Uh, she's been in that position since May of 2018. 
Amber holds a bachelor's degree from Youngstown State University, concentrating in art and psychology. And uh, while working toward her master's degree in American studies, uh, she served as a graduate assistant at the Youngstown Historical Center of Industry and Labor, otherwise known as the Steel Museum. Uh, she has held board positions ranging from secretary of Trees Please here in Youngstown, president of the Wick Park Neighborhood Association, and also as a member of the Charter, Youngstown Charter Review Commission in 2016. Uh, she is working at the McKinley Memorial Museum to modernize the museum and to expand its community outreach. And she spends her free time doing historic hobbies such as spinning, weaving, crochet, and gardening. And I'm very pleased to give you Amber Ferris. All right, can everybody hear me from this position? No? Okay. All right, how's that? Okay. So I wanted to thank Mahoning Valley Historical Society for asking me to come do a presentation for you guys today. This is my first off-site presentation. I've had several at our museum, but this is my first time coming out. So I want to preface and say I am in no way an expert on President McKinley, but I'm an enthusiast. Uh, there may be some gaps in knowledge, and this presentation is full of side stories, conversations about other aspects of his life, and kind of the fun, juicy tidbits. We're not going to talk politics. So, let's get into it. All right. So, ancestry is really fun, um, but President McKinley doesn't have direct descendants in this area. If anyone tries to claim that they're the grandson or granddaughter of President McKinley, they're fibbing. Um, but I'm gonna talk about any of the ways in which one could be related. He has quite a large family. So I'm gonna try out the pointer laser thing, yep. This right here is President McKinley's father, and this is his mother. We're only going to follow the paternal line. So if anyone's done their ancestry, you know how bogged down, how quickly you can get. So, his great-great-grandfather came from Ireland and moved to Western PA. Um, let me adjust this, it's a little overwhelming up there. <laughs> um, John McKinley fought in the Revolutionary War. His occupation was as a weaver, which obviously is pretty cool to me, being historic hobbies. Um, he was born in County Antrim, North Ireland and settled in Crawford County, Ohio. So it's pretty far west of where we currently are, which is an interesting location. He had a son and his name was David McKinley. Now they all had a bunch of kids, but we're just following the specific ones. David also took up the trade of his father. He was considered a weaver. He learned some other things here and there, but that was his primary occupation. He too fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, he was considered a Jeffersonian Democrat, and so we're talking back when the political parties weren't Democrat or Republican. Uh, he was born on May 16, 1755. Uh, he fought close to home in the Revolutionary War. He did something called um, home defense, so he wasn't going out to other locations. More or less, he and his father were fighting in defense of their own home property, so they would muster up uh, a couple of times each before the end of the war. He ended up settling in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, and he married Sarah Gray on December 19, 1780. But Sarah passed away, and in 1795, he moved to Mercer County. He had a total of 10 children. In 1815, he moved to Columbiana and remarried. One of those children, also I hope you really appreciate my fun little maps showing all of their traveling. Um, <laughs> I think that that was interesting that every generation skipped around a lot between Pennsylvania and Ohio. So President McKinley's grandfather was James Stevenson McKinley. He was actually born in Wolf Creek, uh, which is in Pine Township in Mercer County. Uh, that was on September 19th, 1783, but you can see that. He fought in the War of 1812 under William Henry Harrison before he was president, obviously, at the Battle of Tippy Canoe. So we've got three generations of soldiers right there, right off the bat. So you could kind of say it was in President McKinley's blood that he ended up fighting in the Civil War. 
His occupation was carpenter, and then later he worked in iron, which would set a precedent for the family. He managed a coal furnace in Lisbon, sometimes referred to as New Lisbon, and that's in Ohio. Um, so we see, again, people going from Pennsylvania to Ohio to Pennsylvania. He married a lady named Mary Rose. Let's see. One of their 10 children was William McKinley Sr. He too was born in Wolf Creek, uh, and he ended up, his final location was in Canton. He worked in iron for most of his life. He spent a good 20 years at the New Wilmington Furnace, uh, but he also managed furnaces in Niles and in Lisbon. So again, everyone keeps bouncing around. Uh, he was a Whig Republican. So this was very different than that Jeffersonian Democrat that we had just seen. Their second child, um, he was the second child of his father. At 22, he married a lady named Mary Allison. So Mary, a common name. His mom was Mary, his wife was Mary. Uh, and that is where we get the president himself. So William was actually born in Niles, but most of his siblings were born in Lisbon. Sometimes people in this area have the idea that he was born in Lisbon because most of his siblings were. But in fact, he was actually born in Niles, a half a block from my museum. Uh, he spent only the first nine or 10 years of his life there. He fought in the Civil War. So his father was the only one who was not enrolled in military service. His first occupation was lawyer and then president, and he was a Republican. So we can kind of see the transition of political party there. So we're gonna, I just wanted to run you through the ancestry because that's always something someone asks me about. Um, you could possibly be related to President McKinley in about 100 different ways because of how many children each of those people had. So back to the birthplace. President McKinley was born in Niles and his home was significant and people were taking notice even before he became president. But people are always interested in that house because the house that you see if you visit Niles today is not the house that President McKinley was born in. It's a replica. They were able to get really good images and through oral histories were able to provide for what the interior actually looked like. All right, so this is after the house was split in two. Sometime before President McKinley was president, the house was split in two and one part was moved to the rear of the facility. It actually became the um, manufacturing headquarters for a company called Harris. Uh, the other part was moved, so this is the original location. The other part was moved down here. So this is Niles, and this right here is Salt Springs Road and 422. I find this story really interesting. I'm sorry if someone doesn't, but it's, it's fascinating that someone would rip a house into two pieces and then move it around. Uh, <laughs> What was special about this location is something called Riverside Park. Has anyone in this room heard of Riverside Park? Okay, I had neither until I read it. And then I started doing some research. And if you're a member of Niles Historical Society, that's kind of important to them. It was their version of Idora Park. It was built in 1883, and the idea was recreation for people. And it was right along a creek. There are some photos of it that still exist, and it's a quite cool place. So. When it was moved here, they decided to make it a museum for President McKinley. The first floor operated that way. Upstairs, there were tenants. So people were actually living and renting in the home that President McKinley was born in. Uh, the other part was still located right here. So a lady named Lulu Mackey Weiss, she was the first female jurist in Trumbull County. She bought both halves of that property. And she moved them to right here. Again, why are we moving this house so many times? Um, and in each circumstance, it was falling into disrepair and then being put together a little bit nicer. But that location, that number three, that's on the corner of 422 and Robbins Avenue, that kind of area. And at that time, it looked like this. So you can see that it didn't look like that beautiful strip mall that we have now. Um, she turned it into a museum for the president. She was a really, really, really big fan of him. Uh, unfortunately, her museum started drawing less visitors after my facility was built. 
It was just a little bit nicer. So people stopped visiting her museum. She died in 1934, and then it burned to the ground in 1936. Um, so a lot of the artifacts that she collected were gone in that. But we still have a great museum regardless. So, okay. So let's talk about his childhood in Niles. This image right here is the little white schoolhouse that President McKinley went to as a child. And this guy right here is someone we all probably know, Joseph Butler Jr. Now, Joseph Butler Jr. is famous here in Youngstown for a lot of reasons, most specifically his gorgeous art museum. It was the first art museum dedicated to American art in the entire world. But before all of that, he was President McKinley's boyhood friend, and he attempted to rescue him at one point from drowning. So this is a pretty famous story. If you've heard it, again, I apologize. But when the boys were young, they were playing down in the creek as they did, because what else was there to do in the late 1840s? And uh, McKinley got in over his head. The story goes for the third time Butler attempted to rescue him. Well, then Butler gets in over his head and he too needs rescued. So their older, stronger friend named Jacob Scheller, uh, he went in and rescued both of those boys. Uh, that's the best childhood story that we have. Uh, personality study-wise, President McKinley was very studious and very much enjoyed the family leisure time of reading and hanging out in their dining room studying books, uh, which brings us to those early years. Um, before the family moved from Niles to Poland, that was what their recreation was. And William McKinley Sr. and Mary Allison, they really thought that it was important to instill education in their child. And with William, it really became apparent that he was taking up the task of what they set forth. So the Niles school system wasn't that great, and they wanted better for their child. And they decided that they were going to move mother and all the children that were still at home to Poland, Ohio. So in 1851 or two, they moved there. Now you can see it says no one knows. I uh, use a little bit of my field trip notes from this. Kids really enjoy those sorts of joke jokes. But uh, the family moves to Poland and he enrolls in Poland Union Academy. Uh, I researched really hard and I couldn't find any really good photos of this beautiful building. But this was an important moment in William McKinley's life. He was able to attain a higher education. He was able to learn Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. None of those things were actually offered at the school. He took it upon himself for, through independent study to learn those languages. So from an early age, you see a self-starter and someone who was really interested in becoming a better version of themselves. He was also the president of a thing called the Everett Literary, Literary Society. Now, this was where the kids would get together on their own after school and meet and discuss literature. That's a pretty big undertaking for a young teenager, but again, self-motivated. They actually had uh, finished the upper floor of the building that they went to school in to be their meeting room, and they had this really beautiful carpet installed. And it was so beautiful and so expensive that they weren't allowed to walk on it in their shoes. Now, William was the president of this society, and he had to lead their very first meeting with this beautiful carpet and his stockings, which was, I guess, a tad salacious because they made note about it in the history books. Um, but everyone had had uh, slippers made ahead of time, except for him. Uh, this is interesting as his future wife, Ida, is said to have crocheted over 4,000 slippers in her lifetime. That's a lot of slippers. <laughs> Another interesting note I wanted to add in here is that the McKinleys were religious people, but they weren't outwardly very religious to most other people. In 1858, he went to a revival. So in the early 1800s and late 1700s, religion it wasn't what it is today. People weren't carrying it around with them and uh, talking about it as much. So groups of people were doing uh, religious revivals and traveling around. And one of these traveling revivals really caught his eye. And he stepped up and asked to be accepted as a Methodist. And they said, you're one of us now. Uh, this carries through with him for the rest of his life. He does become a devout Methodist, and it shapes a lot of his beliefs and personality going forward. Um, 
So in this time though, while he's in high school, he's actually working as an assistant um, to the postmaster. He works as a post office clerk, kind of like we all like have side jobs. Most of our side jobs were babysitting or mowing grass. His was as a post office clerk. So this is probably the funniest moment in the entire thing. After he graduates high school at the ripe old age of 16, as one did in the 1850s, he had the opportunity to attend Allegheny College over in Meadville. Before I say this, has anyone actually, did anyone go to Allegheny College? Okay, I get a lot of guests in the museum who have, and they always tell me a very, very funny story. I'm gonna read you a brief snippet about why McKinley left. The official storyline um, and what he wrote in his journals was that he left due to illness. Um, but their history book says, the reason why McKinley did con not continue at Allegheny are unknown. College legend has it that he was dismissed for the prank of putting a cow in the belfry of Bentley Hall. Beyond records of cows regularly appearing in Allegheny recitation rooms, no data supports this myth. There is better evidence that McKinley and his roommate lodged a goat in the belfry a much easier task to accomplish than the alleged bovine prank. No record of punishment comes down to us. Now, every Allegheny grad, and there are a shocking amount who visit my museum, will tell me that he left a cow up there and they just couldn't figure out how to get it down. I really want that to be true because McKinley is not known as a jokester the entire rest of his life. He's known as a very serious, exemplary model of the Victorian citizen. So, I wanted to read you McKinley's lines. He wrote a letter explaining why he left Allegheny. He says, I felt so much discouraged, he said, that it seemed I never would look forward to anything again. I was discontented for many, many months. It seemed to me that my whole life was to be spoiled by my unfortunate nervousness. I feel like he was a little too young for the quarter life crisis, but I know a lot of people today could really relate to that. So. Even presidents have that moment of self-doubt. And a lot of that was said to be because he was working so hard and studying so much that he wasn't giving himself any, any kind of break whatsoever. Um, so he comes home and his family can't really afford to send him back to school. Um, that's why it's flipped. And uh, he finds work after he's recovered, and he is now again working at the post office on the side as, again, it's an odd side job. Today you couldn't get a part-time side job at the post office, uh, but he did what the next best thing you did was when you couldn't find employment. He became a teacher. Uh, he actually taught at a school in Poland uh, called the Kerr School. Now, the Kerr School, from my best estimations, I really like looking at maps, as you can tell, I really like those maps. Um, he, this Kerr School was on South Avenue across from Ruley Brothers. So if you guys have an approximate idea of where that's at, it's by, I pinpointed it to about where there's an optometrist office. His family always lived in downtown Poland, right in where all those historic, beautiful homes are. Uh, so that's about a two and a half mile walk. In that time, if you were a teacher, you could board around at the different pupils' homes. And so that was a way that they helped accommodate the paltry pay, was you would have free room and board. But he chose not to do this, and he decided to be a martyr for the cause and walk a good two and a half miles each way every single day. Oh, there's another photo. There we go. This is a photo of him when he is a teacher. Uh, I really enjoy his bow tie. He's photographed several times in that bow tie. Uh, it's a really good one. Uh, his earnings as a teacher were $25 a month. Now, adjusted for 2019 numbers, another one of my favorite things to do is look up inflation rates. Uh, that would be $758.17. That's about what our minimum wage was. And he was charged with teaching all of the children. But he only did this for one semester. And the reason was the Civil War. He felt called to join up. Uh, in 1861, he enlisted on the steps of the Old Stone Tavern in Poland. Now this building at that time, it had been built in 1804. So it was already an old, pretty worn out establishment, but it was still the community gathering place. And that was where everyone was enlisting. 
an interesting note about that is that he signed up when he heard that Lincoln was offering three-month enlistments. So he and his buddies were like, yeah. I mean, they had to beg their parents. Their parents weren't super keen on this idea. But they're like, okay, three months, we can do that. So they get to Columbus and find out that it was three years of the end of the war. That's quite a big difference in terms of uh, commitment, but they felt that it was still a strong enough cause. And a side note, the McKinley family, they were staunch abolitionists. So they really did believe in the cause. Um, that photo is a current photo. I tried finding some good historic photos for you, but they kind of all just look the same. That building hasn't changed much since 1804. Um, so in 1862, he was a commissary sergeant. So McKinley's role was taking care of people. And this is something that kind of hangs with him for the rest of his life. He was present at, present at the Battle of Antietam. And the, oh, that one's not up yet. Oh. Um, this was his original enlistment photo. Quite a handsome man. Uh, let's go back one more. This monument is erected to him. And according to uh, one of the best books on the matter, he, he went against orders and served coffee. The monument actually says, without order, served hot coffee and warm food to every man in the regiment on this spot in doing so had to pass under fire. The actual story is that he was told not to do this. And he went against his colonel's orders and went to take care of people. One of the reasons was is that he didn't want to leave anyone behind. And so he took his own life into his hands and thought it was worth the risk. And now at Antietam, there's a, the coffee monument as it's called for serving coffee. Um, it's right behind Burnside Bridge. So one of the coolest things about this time is McKinley was underneath of a, um, he, he was serving alongside a doctor and they captured some Confederate soldiers. And he went to visit these soldiers and the doctor starts handing the Confederate soldiers cash out of his pocket. And now this didn't make a lot of sense to McKinley because why would that make any sense? Why are you handing the Confederate soldiers your money? You're a Union doctor. And the doctor said, they're Masons, they're one of us. So it doesn't matter if I'll ever get it back, I need to take care of them. And the exact quote from McKinley on this is, if that is Masonry, I will take some of it myself. So he decided he wanted to be a Mason because, you know, it's a great protection if you're ever in a pinch and you need some extra cash. So he enlisted as a, enlisted, um, was sworn in as a Mason in this building right here. And there is still a plaque there denoting this big to-do. Uh, and it's an interesting spot because it's in Winchester, Virginia. It was basically on the border of the North and the South, and it changed hands multiple times. Uh, I actually was just entertaining a Masonic group Monday night, and this is a very large part of their lore, uh, that McKinley being a Union soldier getting sworn in at this facility was uh, very important. The next photo I have up here shows the insanity of how many different ranks he achieved. And this is before he became president. He made it all the way to Knight of Malta by 1884. He isn't even governor of Ohio at this point. Uh, even the Masons were explaining to me that what he did was a remarkable feat. All right. So a good reminder to listen to your family. He comes home from the Civil War, and his older sister, Anna, is a teacher in Canton, Ohio. The McKinley High School in Canton isn't named for President McKinley. It's named for Anna McKinley. She was well liked, she was a teacher, and she became principal of that school. And she said to him, all right, William, you need to figure out what you're doing with your life because you've done a lot and you're not finishing anything except for that Civil War thing. So she said, I think you'd be a fantastic lawyer. Why don't you go to law school? 
So he packs up his stuff and he attends Albany Law School in New York. Their records show that he was the class of 1867. In reality, he didn't actually graduate from Albany, another not finishing. Um, he does receive his honorary doctorate in law later in life. Uh, but at that time, you didn't have to finish law school. You didn't have to graduate. You basically needed to study or clerk underneath of a judge. So he does one year at Albany, and he comes home to Poland, and he studies under Judge Glyden in Poland, who is, was really only a few years older than him. But he was able to study enough law text and pass the Ohio bar in Trumbull County. And uh, then what did Anna tell him? Well, come to Canton. That's where you're going to live now. And he said, OK. So he went to Canton, which is where he made the rest of his life. And his mother and any siblings that were still remaining in Poland went along with him. When he was in Canton, he was practicing law. He had his own law practice. And he met a lady named Ida Saxton. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ida before I tell you about how they met. Ida was considered a socialite, uh, but she wasn't your typical socialite as we think of them today. She actually had a job. She was schooled at Brook Hall Female Seminary in Media, Pennsylvania from 1865 to 1868. That is right outside of Philadelphia. In that time, that was kind of unusual, but only the finest young ladies went to something like that. It was considered a finishing school more than it was an actual college, but uh, she still went there. And the reason was that her father owned the Stark County Bank, and they were very, very wealthy. And he wanted to make sure that she never had to rely on a man to take care of her. So he wanted to make sure she would have gainful employment. So she started as a clerk and was soon promoted to cashier. And then when her father was away from Canton, she was entrusted with managing the bank. We had a female bank manager in the 1860s. That's pretty impressive. Uh, she worked there up until 1871. Uh, she did get a lot of uh, flack from the males in, that were around her and that worked at the bank. They kind of resented her. But it was her right to go to work, and it was what her father wanted, and it was important to them. They actually, Ida met President McKinley in 1869, but she was engaged to somebody else. She went to Europe for a six-month trip, and as what happens in the 1860s and 70s, she returned from her six-month trip, and he had died. Uh, so a short time later, they meet again when she's at the bank. So they'd met, met at a picnic at a beautiful lake. Um, she doesn't remember this. He naturally does because he's smitten. And then he pops in the bank where he's actually the lawyer for the bank, and uh, they hit it off. She remembers this, obviously, at this point. And uh, they courted for about two years. So here we have a beautiful photo right before the wedding. Uh, most of the photos don't show her as nicely, and I think that this is a really gorgeous photo of her. This is their wedding invitation. It has all of the details on it. Um, I would love to have a better version of this. Unfortunately, you know, it's 1870s paper, so that's the best we're going to get for clarity. Uh, but they got married, and they, they were enamored with each other. And this is something that stays true until the end. They married in December of 18, or they married, and by December of 1871, their daughter Katie is born. So almost instantaneously, they had a daughter. Uh, in March 1873, Ida's mom dies, and then her daughter Ida is born, and by the end of the year, both daughters are dead. Um, this was a very common thing in the 1870s, obviously, but usually people made up for dying children by having lots of them. In their case, Ida developed epilepsy during her second pregnancy. They never had any more children because she was prone to epileptic fits. They didn't actually use the word epilepsy in that time. Medicine was just so radically different. They actually thought that if you were epileptic that it was a function of mental illness. So the McKinley family did their best to hide Ida's epilepsy that they could. They called them her fits or her spells in conjunction with the epilepsy, which obviously made it difficult to be pregnant and then to have more children. Uh, she suffered from depression, but who wouldn't losing both of your daughters and your mother in the same year and really going into thro the throes of a debilitating illness that had no treatment whatsoever. 
This creates a very devout husband. President McKinley is known for a lot of things, but I prefer to think of him as a devoted husband and a caretaker. This photo is taken during the presidency and Ida is usually seen sitting. This is her official first lady uh, portrait. One of the few photos you're going to see of her standing. I'm gonna say 75% are seated. It's because she just didn't have the strength. Um, I borrowed these photos from the Library of Congress because they are the crispest and nicest. Um, because of her health and her devotion to her husband, she actually chose to stand for six hours during their 25th wedding anniversary party. He had just been elected president. And one of the things that was really important in that time, because again, the Victorian era, era we have this very prim and proper and modest and for formal everything. And it was important for the nation and the people in Canton to see her as a, a pillar of strength. And so for this party, they threw this ridiculously large party, invited thousands of people, and for six hours, they stood in a receiving line shaking hands with people. Now, if you have a debilitating illness, you could understand that that would be a very, very hard thing for her to do. But that's how much her husband's presidency meant to her and being able to show that strength. Um, some of the things that she enjoyed were the White House Conservatory where she could sit amongst the plants, find clothing. One of the interesting points is that President McKinley wanted to make sure that she always had the best of everything. A lot of that had to do with her upbringing, but she always had the nicest things. She enjoyed a good crochet session. Again, 4,000 plus slippers. We have a pair on display at our museum. Um, and most of all, she loved her husband. And he loved her very much. During his presidency, he was said to have, while she was awake, doted on her as much as he possibly could. And then at night, he would stay up smoking cigars and doing the rest of his work. Those were his hobbies, taking care of Ida and smoking cigars. But you would never see him smoking a cigar in public. She actually died six years after his assassination. He was literally her everything. So I'm going to move on to some interesting facts, because uh, I see that I'm nearing time. Um, so the reason we have the carnation as the state flower is that during McKinley's first election to the U.S. House of Representatives, a friend who was a florist gave him one as a boutonniere, and he wore it and was subsequently elected. He found it to be lucky. So for the entire rest of his public life, he kept a bowl of carnations on hand at the White House or speaking engagements. And the reason was is that if he saw a child or someone, he could give them a carnation that he wore and replace it quickly so that everyone could say that they had a carnation worn by their president. Uh, it became our state flower in 1905, and it's a nice symbol for uh, a, a nice person. Uh, so there's a story I wanted to read you about President McKinley being a farmer, and it shows how different our perceptions can be of things. He actually owned and maintained three farms here in Northeast Ohio through his presidency. As I'm sure someone in this room has interacted with someone who lives in that town. Um, there is, hold on, there's a really good quote about it, and apparently I'm not as prepared as I thought I was. So the guy who was managing his farm and lived on the farm, his quote during the presidency was, McKinley is a farmer, said Jack Adams. He keeps right in touch with everything that's doing down this way. Nobody else knows, but you bet I know. The newspapers told all about the president's worrying about battles and things, but they didn't know how much he's worrying, do, how much worrying he's been doing about this farm. The papers said once the president is set up all night to get the news from Santiago, but I know better. The president was awaiting to hear from me as to whether it was true that the chinch bugs were eating up the corn. Another time when the papers told about the big furrows in the president's forehead because of worrying about some foot transport or another. I knew very well he was worrying about whether or not I ought to turn the cows into the West 40 or put the land into wheat. And the president got so nervous he couldn't hardly sit still that week. Old Dobbin fell into the well and took two days to pour, pull the poor critter out. Mr. McKinley is a real farmer. He's got that farmer Bill Bryan beat to death. So people back home really thought that McKinley was really, really worried about his farm when he was dealing with the uh, Spanish-American War. He actually had a presidential pet parrot, and uh, here's where I get into my fun numbers again. The pet parrot was given to him by a friend, and the friend paid $1,300. Now at that time, 
$1,300 was a large amount of money. Today's equivalent would be $39,000. They are considered endangered and only are allowed to be sold and kept in captivity if they've been bred in captivity, and you could purchase one for $2,500 today. Uh, so at that time, though, it wasn't one that had been bred. It was a captured, endangered parrot, and that's not okay, but at that time, it was his pet parrot. He was known as the White House Greeter, which is really interesting. McKinley had trained him to say things like, oh, welcome, pretty ladies, and uh, sing Yankee Doodle Dandy. McKinley would hum the first few bars, and then the parrot would finish it. And here's the kicker. The parrot's name was the Washington Post. Some people don't believe that it was a, a slight against the paper because it was a fledgling paper. It had only been around about 20 years, but uh, it's still an interesting story. So President McKinley was the president of a lot of firsts. He was the first to have an inaugural viewing stand for the inaugural parade. One of those reasons that they built that, it was entirely made out of glass, was to shelter Ida from the rain on inauguration day. And it's something he started and has stuck through. We have the inaugural luncheon. They were the first to do that. Because of Ida's epilepsy, he made it a big deal about she needed to sit next to him at dinner in case she went through one of her spells. Uh, so we've heard a lot about federal uh, presidential doctors recently and giving their bills of health. That President McKinley was the first one to have a federally funded uh, physician. Prior to that, your physician, that was your business. You, that had nothing to do with your funds at the White House. And same thing with your transportation. Uh, if you needed to get somewhere, you were paying for it. Uh, he was the first to bring in a White House press room. He was the first to campaign by phone, and he was the first to visit California. And we have this nice stereograph of him visiting California. And that's in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Park. He was also the first to have a war room and a foreign policy. So prior to that, we were such a fledgling nation, we were really trying to build our mark and no one was considering us a world power. And McKinley really did try to stay out of the Spanish-American War because he'd been in the Civil War, he didn't want to see us lose any lives. Unfortunately, 3,000 were lost. Um, but he was the first person to have that. We hadn't needed a policy before that or hadn't thought that we needed it. He was also the first president to ride in an automobile. Unfortunately, no one thought that that was a photograph-worthy moment, so instead we have a stock photo of the Stanley brothers riding in a Stanley steamer. But he did not, in fact, own an automobile at any point. It wouldn't be for a few more presidents till we had an official presidential automobile. He was the first to use campaign pins. So, why this is important is before his presidency, we had ribbons and you would hand out handbills, and that was still really popular during his campaigning. But he set a precedent for how campaign buttons would look because they'd only been patented in 1894. And it was by a, a very smart woman named Amanda Lugy. She was looking for a different method for buttoning clothing. But a company called Hogue and Blackstub saw this as an opportunity and they actually made the very first um, cellulose covered buttons. And this becomes a legacy. President McKinley, everyone knows he was the first one to use them. And they took off like wildfire. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of versions of these floating around the United States still. And because of his assassination, six months into his second term, they were instantly collector's items. Uh, we have a huge collection at our museum, and self-plug for just one moment, I'm still working on, and I will announce a date at some point soon, uh, an exhibit about some of our best collection campaign pins. Um, and I think I will close with telling you he is the first president to appear on film, but we are now at my time. Uh, it's a very interesting film, and the reason that it's important is that he didn't really want to do it, but his brother Abner, who was always interested in a scheme, a little money-making scheme, invested in an automobile, or a, a film company, and said, you should do this for your campaign. Let's put you on film, and I bet you that's gonna get people interested. Now, it's not a very interesting film, but it just shows him walking around with uh, his brother, essentially, uh, campaigning. So, I think that's it. Uh, did you guys want to do questions and answers? Okay, anyone have any questions? Yes.
Yes. And so annually, Mahoney County Republican organization, and the Democrat, through the uh, Republican in Trumbull County, the GOP, we hold an annual banquet to honor uh, President McKinley. And there's a gentleman by the name of Mike Watson. He imitates uh, McKinley, he does a great job. And, uh, and just as I sat here, I remember they said that and we have to sing uh, Nearer My God today, because that was one of McKinley's uh, favorite hymns. So we have to sing that at this band. <laughs> and also, we meet at the memorial, and there's no kitchen facilities there. And so when this band was started, this, uh, the Masons have a hall on the street adjacent to the McKinley, so they would cook the meal in the Masonic Temple, and they carved it over. It's a museum and auditorium. So the first, the only sanctioned uh, presidential presenter for President McKinley is Mike Wilson. He's the director of Scope in Champion. He's a really nice guy. He comes out to a lot of our events. You can meet him um, at library events or the museum events. Um, I do have information about President McKinley, our museum, the birthplace replica home, there's sign-ups for um, little cards that you can take home to sign up for their newsletters and mine. Um, we even have a President McKinley coloring page. Uh, but yes, what you said about the banquet is uh, it's an annual gathering between the Republican clubs for Mahoning, Columbiana, and Trumbull County. They, that's coming up in March. And uh, yeah, they used to cook the food over at the Masonic Temple and uh, bring it over across the way because we don't have a kitchen. And one more thing. You were talking about moving it out of the McKinley Memorial and moving it to a banquet hall. Oh, it's all kind of uproar. <laughs> and some of the guys, they said, well, we could have a martini if we had it. Some of the I think McKinley was a teacher. I think he was a Methodist. He was a Methodist and. Well, actually, actually, uh, Ida upset a lot of the temperance movement women uh, because she did allow drinking at events. They were not against that as a family. Um, if you'd like to visit our museum, we're open Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4. We are privately run, so we don't have to be ADA compliant, unfortunately, so we are not. We have stairs, no elevators or lifts or anything like that. So just as a quick note about visiting. You had a question? I just wonder, what number president was he? The 25th. Thank you. Yeah. And he's the reason we got Teddy Roosevelt, but that's a side story. Uh, we wouldn't have had, had uh, Teddy Roosevelt if it weren't for President McKinley and his buddy Mark Hanna. Anything else, guys? Yes. I didn't go to Allegheny, but I visited there, and they give a tour, and the incident with the tower and the expulsion was that McKinley and two of his buddies took a cow to the third floor, and cows will walk steps, cows but they don't go down. So in order to remove the cow, the president of the college had to have the cow killed on the third floor. Yeah, that's the story that, that grads tell me when they come into the museum. That's not in their history book. They try to try to call that, but yeah. That's the only story of McKinley ever being a prankster. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you again, Amber. That was a very well-rounded and interesting presentation on 
our Mahoning Valley native, uh, William McKinley, President of the United States. Thank you all for coming again today. Please ask about Cookie Table and Cocktails with Linda or any other information about upcoming programs with Tracy Manning, who's sitting back at the uh, refreshment table as well. Otherwise, we hope to see you four weeks from today on Thursday, March 21st, for a look at the John Stark Edwards family. Have a good day.